I can't tell you what the timing relationship is between this input and the clock on the input. Because it's moving with temperature, with voltage. And that depends on how the parts situated, what the precision of that voltage regulator was, how hot the box is. That means in the real world, I just can't do this. It doesn't work. There's no way I can make a big chip work from the clock in the clock tree and the data from the flip-flop. I have the same problem taking data from the flip-flop off the chip. I couldn't tell you what cycle is going to come out of it. I don't know. Is that bad? So every big chip, and big isn't as big as you think, does the following. We place a phase lock loop. And let me just represent the phase lock loop. I'll move this thing right now. The phase lock loop consists of a voltage control oscillator. We play the blue with more blue in it. Hopefully one of these blues is bluer. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the output of the voltage controlled oscillator and run that into the clock tree. Okay. Now, the input to the voltage controlled oscillator has a loop filter, so the thing's stable, usually a second order filter, a couple of resistors, capacitors, or digital nowadays. And then I have a circuit here, which is called a phase frequency detector. Two flip flops and an end gate will build one, they're not hard. Okay, into that I run my external clock, and into the phase frequency detector I run the output of my clock tree. Now this is a feedback loop, so what will happen is, is if the frequency of the phase are different from the input here, not going through a big clock tree, I will adjust this oscillator until the phase and frequency match. That's what a phase lock loop does. Enjoy that sort of thing, go take the 27. Okay, because that's one of the circuits they talk about here. Modeling. Now, why do I say every chip has to have one of these? Well, let's take a look. Let's suppose the temperature changes. Oh, this delay changes dramatically. The loop simply adjusts the phase of this oscillator to compensate. And it can do it over a period of a few milliseconds. So what happens right away is, in order to make all this funky electrical stuff work out, I put in a phase lock loop. What's the next thing that happens? My flip-flop over here, who's on the same tree, I can connect him directly to the input because this clock exactly matches the clock on the edge of the chip. The independence of process, temperature, So in reality, we don't run clocks directly to any of our chips. They all come in to a phase lock loop. And the purpose of the phase lock loop is to accommodate a clock with an exact relationship to the outside of the chip. Every big chip has one. Every microprocessor of any size has one. Every FPGA of any size has four, typically, because they have four clock trees. So you go look at the Xilinx or Altera, and they've got phase lock loops. And that's really good. Now let me put the plug in to the future lecture. Interesting thing you can do. If I put a counter in here that divides by N, this circuit still matches the phase and frequency of the reference clock, and now the oscillator's running N times faster. So my frequency out is equal to frequency in multiplied by that divider in the oscillator track. Okay? That's really handy. That says I can bring in 10 megahertz and make 400. Just divide by 40. And it works. That low pass filter, I don't have to have stuff every clock. In fact, usually it's got a very low frequency. If I get stuff a few hundred kilohertz, I'm fine. So I can divide a lot. 
Now the next thing is, I can put another divider here on the reference. Now that slows down when it comes to the phase frequency detector, and that's the divider of the reference. Now we call this a frequency synthesizer in some parlance. I just call it PLL. Most of them for ASICs have about eight bit counters. And with eight bit counters, you can take any external clock you can imagine. When we do this lecture for real, we'll do some examples in class. And within half a percent, you can hit any arbitrary frequency. Now, why am I telling you this right now? Well, what I want you to be aware of is the clocks get really special frequency to make them work. And it compensates for all this temperature variation and everything else we look at. Here's some good news. Remember I said don't worry about a long path? Because if this was designed to run at 200 megahertz, and you say crap, it only runs at 199.5, I can reprogram that PLL and put it in, and we're now running at 199.5 megahertz. If you need 199.4, I can give you that. It's that simple. Wow! Every FPGA, every microprocessor of any size has 8 bit 20 megahertz. Has. Okay. And probably every ASIC you work on will have one or more of them to make this clock. This means if I want a 400 megahertz clock, I don't care what I start with, I can make 400. If I say something's a long path, how can I find out if I have a long path in the design problem? It's really simple. You pick up a can of ozone depleting CFC spree spray, and you spray it on the chip. The chip automatically goes to minus 40 degrees C. If you want to get good, you get a liquid nitrogen tank, we go way down, like minus 70. If it suddenly starts working, you have a long path. Then you take a hair dryer, or what we call a heat gun, and you heat it up, and if it fails consistently, you know it was a long path. Sometimes you'll be on the edge of working and failing. Erases, doesn't help. Erase fails at every speed, because the logic scales together too. Okay. Sometimes just raising the voltage, and then blowing something on the part to get rid of the heat.